Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Good morning. We are from the New Testament Church of God in Tunapuna, Maitawa Street. We are pleased to be able to present to you the gospel of Jesus Christ from our church this morning. As many of you would know, and indeed the whole world knows, we are currently in the straits of a coronavirus. This virus has taken over the entire world. Uh, many countries are afflicted. There's, there have been many deaths that have occurred. But we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that he is able to save, deliver, heal, and set free. We believe that he is God Almighty and that he is king over everything in the earth. We believe that this did not catch God by surprise. God has his purpose and his plan that he will effect in the earth even in the midst of this virus. Even now, many people are being called to salvation. Even now, many people are looking for an answer. And it is the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God, the saints of the Most High God, who have the answer for this dying and desperate world. Jesus Christ gave us a commission, the Great Commission. He said to go into all the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ, teaching them everything that I have taught you. We go to baptize, we go to teach, we go to set people free from the darkness that is in this world. And Jesus promised that he is with us until the end of the age. Brothers and sisters, we are coming to that end. We are coming to that end. Look at the darkness that exists. Look at the collapse of the start market. Look at everything that is going around. But I thank God that he is with us still until the very end. I thank God that we have a hope. We are not like those who are hopeless. We have the hope of Jesus Christ. We have the fact that since he arose, we also too, scripture tells us in Romans 6, that we also too will live with him. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us the very same thing, that his resurrection was our resurrection and that one day we will be with him. And so these are all things that must happen in this world, but I thank God that we have an eternal hope. For where he is, we will be too also. And so this morning, from Tunapuna New Testament Church of God, we want to bring greetings to you. We want to encourage you. We want to bring the gospel to you. We're going to have worship. We're going to have prayer. We're going to have the word of God preached in power. And I want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you. If you never heard that anybody loved you before, Jesus Christ loves you. And so I'm going to open in a portion of scripture. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, this is what Paul says. Rejoice in the Lord always. In other words, there's always a time to rejoice. Again, I will say rejoice. As if for emphasis to let you know, regardless of what goes on around you, regardless of the calamity, regardless of the cries of people who are concerned and worried and anxious, regardless of the fear that exists around you, you have the peace of God within you. You have the joy of the Lord. You have the peace of God. The same peace that Jesus released when, when the disciples thought that they were going to die, when the waves and the wind were kicking up against the boat. He said, peace be still. And it's that very same peace that we can live in, in the midst of what goes on around us. So Paul continues to say in verse 5, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand, and indeed he is. Be anxious for nothing. In other words, think about it. Work it out in your head. There is nothing at all to be anxious for. Our God is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He has overcome death, hell, sin, and the grave. There's nothing and no one that can come against his name or his power. So Paul encourages us and in fact admonishes us to say, don't be anxious. He says, but in everything by prayer and by supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Catch that. The peace of God will guard you. The peace of God. Peace. You don't normally think of peace as a guard. 
but the peace of God which comes from the very person of Jesus Christ himself. In fact, Romans 14 says that the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it is righteousness, peace. The kingdom of God is peace. In other words, when you live in divine peace, you're living in the atmosphere of God's kingdom. And that dispels the fear that is around you. So you release the peace of God into your situation. That peace will keep you. That peace will guard you. That peace will secure you. That peace of God will guard and secure your mind in Christ Jesus. So your thought life is preserved. Your emotional life is preserved when you focus on the peace of God. It's a powerful thing. It's not something light. In the natural, peace is the absence of war and chaos. But in the kingdom, peace is the presence of Jesus Christ in your life. And it's that peace that you're releasing into every situation around you. People are scared, you release peace. People are concerned, you release hope. People are frightful, you release joy. You release the very thing that counteracts what the world is releasing because you have the kingdom of God within you. Verse 8, finally brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, or whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue or excellence, and if there is any praise, anything praiseworthy, you meditate on these things. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you. Now is the time when our faith is tested. Now is the time when everybody who quoted Psalm 91 has to put it into practice. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High God shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So you've been quoting all these things when we didn't have a crisis. Now is the time that God sees who is faithful and who is not. But I have confidence in my God and I know you can have confidence in Him too. He is the great I am that I am. He is the good shepherd. And he loves his sheep. That means he loves you. So this morning, we want to give you a word of encouragement and a word of hope, knowing that God is more than faithful. I'm your moderator this morning, Reverend Randall Price. We're going to have a wonderful service in the presence of God. Yes, there may be quarantines, and yes, we may have a restricted service, but God is able because the word of God has power. And so right now, I want to introduce Minister Larry Devines, who is going to come to pray for the nation, pray for the nations of the world and also pray for you. God bless you as we continue our service this morning. Good morning. Exodus 23, 25 says, Worship the Lord your God and his blessings will be upon you. You shall be upon your food and water and it will take away sickness from among you. Isaiah 41.10 says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Have faith that the Lord your God is always near. For even though the trials and tribulation of life, you will never walk alone. Father, we give you thanks this morning. We magnify your holy name, Lord God. Your eyes run through and through the, in the earth. And Lord, as the minister says, nothing takes you by surprise. We thank you, Lord, that we are your faithful ones, that you have called out. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, we declare, my Father, that you are the supreme being. You are God of the heavens and the earth. And so we worship you in spirit and in truth today, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that your word do not return to you void. Hallelujah. And we thank you, Father, that you continue to keep your people. Even in the dark moments of our lives, Lord, Father, you able to keep us hallelujah lord we are not ignorant of the devices of the enemy we come against every plot 
every device, every enticement, Lord, we pull down in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We thank you for your son that have gone to the cross, Jesus, to destroy the works of the devil. For they said this is the cause that he was manifested. And so, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for the power of the Holy Ghost moving upon the atmosphere of every nation on the earth. Hallelujah. And Lord, as the, your word go out, we pray, Father, that those that are walking in darkness will come to know you as Lord and Savior. They shall turn from the way of destruction unto life everlasting. Hallelujah. And so, Lord, let your word continue to go forth and run down into the streets and corners of every nation, every crowning crook, and let your name be glorified, Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary. That blood that speaketh expressively today. Hallelujah. We bask in your presence, Lord. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you hear the prayer of the righteous, Lord, my God. And you attend to their needs. Hallelujah. We give all honor and glory to you, Lord Father. Touch every heart, every air that hears, Lord Father. We pray, God, that you will enter in and make peace with them. For you said that you give peace. Hallelujah. Not as the world give it. Praise God. We thank you for your peace. Hallelujah. That peace that passes all understanding. And so, Father, be glorified, Lord my God. This is your moment, Lord. Father, we pray that you will glorify yourself. Hallelujah. Even through your people. We give all honor and all glory to you this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. That is who you are, God. Hallelujah. We give you glory. We give you praise. Miracle worker, the one who does miracles, the one who heals, the one who delivers and sets free, the one who is omnipotent. There's nothing that can stand against him. He is the conquering lion of Judah. We thank you, Lord, and we bless your name. My God, that is who you are. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we give you the glory, we give you the glory, we magnify your name this morning God, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up into the house of the Lord. God, we are so grateful that we can worship and we can sing a joyful noise unto the Lord in the midst of the chaos around us. Because we are not defined by what we see. We are defined by who we know. That's God Almighty. And who we know impacts who we are. And we are living out who we are as kingdom citizens, citizens of faith, citizens of heaven. And so, Lord, we are thankful that in the midst of what is going on around us, we can still gather here in these small numbers according to the command of the government. God, in these small numbers, obeying the commands that have been given, but still God glorifying the King of kings and the Lord of glory to give you worship and honor. And now, Lord God, we want to hear your word. And I pray that you will bless your manservant, Bishop Dr. Sinath. I pray, Lord, that you bless him. You give him wisdom. I pray, God, that the word will come forth with power. And I thank you, God, that every person who is listening will be touched, will be ministered to. We give you the glory, God, in the honor and the praise. Now I invite Bishop Sinath to come. Amen. Thank you very much. Welcome to all of you who are looking online. We have had uh, several hundreds running now into the thousands of those of you who have been looking at our Facebook page. And we want to thank you and want to encourage you.
to continue holding on to God in the midst of these uh, trying times that we are going through. It is very tough, but I want to commend all pastors and churches in using this medium by which to have service and by which to meet, reach people. And let us pray fervently that God saves souls in these times that people will realize that we are in the last days. Today I want to speak on the subject, the rise of the Antichrist. And I've chosen this subject because uh, what is happening around us clearly points to what, what Revelation talks about in chapter 6 and uh, right through to 19 and what Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24 and 25. And we have to be aware of what is happening in the world. As uh, Jesus said, we must not be ignorant of these things, uh, but know exactly what is happening. So the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven horns, seven heads, sorry, and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now, this beast that we are uh, reading about has to do with the kingdom, uh, what we call the revived Roman Empire that will come upon the earth not long from now. And when John says that he had ten horns it refers to 10 nations coming together and now he says now the beast which I saw was like a leopard his feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power the dragon here is the devil who gave this man the antichrist so the beast has to do with the kingdom the revived roman empire but it also has to do with the man who would head up this revived roman empire whom the bible refers to as the antichrist and the devil will give him power and give him his throne and great authority and i saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was hailed, and all the world marvel and followed the beast. In other words, he would perform such uh, miracles, signs, and wonders. It does not mean here, however, that he will die like Christ and be raised from the dead. It does not mean that he's not going to die and rise because the devil cannot raise anybody from the dead. But the kind of signs and wonders he'll be performing, people will be deceived by this man called the Antichrist or the beast. And the Bible says, so they worship the dragon, that's the devil, who gave authority to the beast. And they worship the beast himself saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and he was given authority to continue for 42 months or three and a half years which would be the latter half of the tribulation period because the tribulation period would run for seven years. Seven years by 12 months each would be 84 months. So for 42 months, the latter half, the Antichrist will be a real dictator in the world. Then the Bible says, he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. That's a true and living God. He blasphemes the name of God and blasphemes God's tabernacle and those who dwell in heaven. It was granted to him to make war with the saints. That's during the tribulation period where many saints are going to be persecuted. And if you think that we have Christian persecution now, what is yet to come is far worse than what we are seeing now. In several countries, I know Christians are being persecuted, but there is yet worse persecution to come. So the Antichrist will per persecute those who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And in fact, when we read Revelation chapter 4 and 5, we we'll read where many saints during the tribulation period will be killed for their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is why we warn you and we exhort you to live holy and walk uprightly now. Because if you don't make it in the rapture, you will be left behind to go through the tribulation period. And it's going to be a million times worse than this. In fact, the Bible says that the world is going to be cast into such uh, turmoil and catastrophes 
that the world has never known before. It's going to be so terrible. And I urge you, make sure that you are ready because the rapture can take place at any moment. So the Bible says it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Again, that means persecution and death for many, many who would claim Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And authority was given him over every tribe, tongue, and nation. And this tells about the worldwide authority and power that he will have. All who dwell on the earth, the Bible says, will worship him, whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks and praise and we worship you. We ask, O oh God, that as we speak your word, that you would touch hearts and help us to understand so that we would know the times that we are living in and God, that we would really commit our lives lives to you to serve you and to walk in your spirit in Jesus amen and amen as we continue to examine what the Bible says about the last days and how what we are experiencing presently today relate to end times I want to expound on um, the emergence of a man who will come upon this world not long from now and whom the world will embrace. And the Bible says they will even worship him. And when they worship him, they are actually worshiping the devil because he will be Satan's masterpiece upon the earth. A man whom the world would refer to as the Messiah and the one who will rule the nations of the earth. This man will appear on the world scene as having the solution to the world's problems. And he's going to be so brilliant according to what Daniel says in Daniel chapter 7 and chapter 8. He says that this man is going to have such great eyes, meaning intelligence and a mouth that speaks, you know, profoundly. And people are going to be caught by that. This man will also perform great signs and wonders. And we thank God for signs and wonders today. We thank God for the Holy Spirit working through uh, those who are committed to him. But don't think that every sign and every wonder is from God. You better make sure and check your Bible and make sure that uh, the signs and wonders are truly of the Holy Spirit. People from all the nations of the earth will be deceived by this man whom the Bible calls the Antichrist. And as we look at Bible prophecy today, we are witnessing... <clears throat> Real actual developments taking place all around the world to, to what the total fulfillment of the judgments recorded in Revelation chapter 6 to 19. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> as, these, as the road is being prepared for the emergence of this man who the Bible calls the Antichrist, as the road has been prepared for him to arise... We must take note, saints of God, that the time is drawing to a close. Now, <clears throat> Daniel the prophet speaks about these same events that will occur in what is called the 70th week of Daniel from Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 to 27. And Daniel's 70th week is, again, the same as the tribulation period. And it's that period when the Antichrist, or who is also called a false messiah, will arise and he will become the supreme ruler of the earth. But as Daniel 9 and Revelation 19 tell us, the rulers, this ruler's dominance will only last for 42 months, or three and a half years. And take note, it, it is talking about that time when he holds dominance over the world. So he actually begins in the beginning of the seven year tribulation period. But it's as the middle of the tribulation period where he gains dominance over the world and controls the world. And he does so for 42 months. So don't think it's just the second half. No, he rules from the beginning but does not get world dominance until the middle of the tribulation period and it is at the end of this tribulation period that Jesus the Bible says will return from heaven and he will come with all the angels and with the, his host and thank God we are going to be with him those who are raptured we are going to be with him 
And we're going to come back with him riding on horses to fight the one day battle called the battle of Armageddon. And when Jesus has finished fighting this battle, the Bible says he will cast the Antichrist, that man who will be Satan's masterpiece. And the Antichrist will have a false prophet. So the false prophet will be performing signs and wonders and telling people everywhere to worship the beast, worship the Antichrist. But Jesus Christ, when he comes and he fights the battle of Armageddon, he's going to cast the antichrist and the false prophet alive into the lake of fire now seeing therefore that the bible cannot lie and that jesus will conquer the enemies in the end he will conquer the enemies just as he did 2000 years ago at calvary when he conquered satan hell and the grave we have this confidence that in the midst of the coronavirus in the midst of the collapse of the economy in the midst of the unfortunate situation with locusts eating up the greens in Sudan and uh, Ethiopia and Somalia and Jordan <clears throat> and some other countries in Africa in the midst of all of this we have the hope and confidence that Jesus Christ is coming again and he said in his word let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house and many mansions if it were not so I would have told you but I go to prepare a place for you and if I go I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also this is the comfort that we have so church of God do not be shaken by what you are seeing do not become cynical or be troubled remember that God is still in control and Jesus Christ is going to come again and he is going to fix planet earth all the despots of this world all the governments and all the presidents and kings of the earth they don't have the answer to fix planet earth's problem but Jesus Christ the son of God is going to return and he will fix this earth thank God we will be free from all diseases we will be free from death we will be free from pestilences we will not have to worry about these things because the prince of peace is going to come again and let me remind you to continue to have faith in God because when the plagues and diseases came over Egypt. God protected Israel even though Israel was living in Egypt at the time. If you are covered in the blood of Jesus, you don't have to worry. Walk uprightly and trust God. The Bible says, except the Lord watches over the city, the watchman watches in vain. So it's good to follow all the protocols about cleanness and health and everything. We must follow all of these things. But listen to me, except we have faith in God, all that we do is still futile. Thank God he's watching over his own. No plague shall come nigh thy dwelling. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Have faith in God, trust in God, and he he will keep you. This virus will not last forever. The Lord God will bring changes to planet earth. But remember this. This is not the end of the world as yet. Because God is yet to pour out his divine judgments upon this world. Which will be far worse than the coronavirus. And after he has cast all his judgments upon the earth. Then God will bring back this planet to perfect peace and prosperity. Thank God Jesus is going to come again. And when he comes he will rule this world from Jerusalem. He is going to set up his throne. And for 1,000 years the Bible says the world will be in peace and prosperity. And all nations will go up to Jerusalem to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Now who is the Antichrist? Throughout the centuries, you know, people have always been speculating about who the Antichrist is. And they have come up with many, many different persons who they think that the Antichrist might be. Some have thought that Judas would resurrect and become the Antichrist. And that's because Jesus called him the son of perdition. Paul says the Antichrist is the son of perdition. But that does not mean that Judas will resurrect and become <clears throat> the Antichrist. Now, others have said it's the Roman Catholic Pope. This too is definitely wrong. Some have even said it was Adolf Hitler. Still others claim it would be Barack Obama. And all of these are obviously wrong and very misleading because Paul says clearly that no one will know 
who the Antichrist is until he is manifested or revealed in the tribulation period. So it is very insensible for you to be thinking that it is this one or that one. Forget about that. Study and focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't worry about who the Antichrist will be. Study who Jesus is. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. He is the answer. He is the healer. He is the divine protector. Thank God for our Lord and Savior. Now the Bible clearly indicates that the Antichrist will be a man. A normal man who will rise to power almost overnight and he will command the attention of the entire world. It is possible that this man could be in the world today. Possible. I'm not saying he is. I'm just saying it could be possible at present. But even if he is, we still cannot know who this man is because Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 to 12 that there are conditions that must be fulfilled before the Antichrist can be revealed. So even if you see the number 666 and you hear things about the Antichrist, remember this, the Antichrist, the man who will be the Antichrist cannot be revealed or manifested until certain conditions are met. Now, Paul says to the church at Thessalonians and the Thessalonians were very, very troubled um, about the coming of the Lord, they weren't sure about some things, and Paul had to write to correct them, and he said, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord, Jesus Christ, and our gathering to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. So he's telling them, clearly the day of Christ has not come as yet. Some were thinking that, the, the day of Christ had come. But he said, no. Let no one deceive you by any means. And I want you to take note of this. Paul himself, like Jesus Christ, calls upon believers to beware of deception. And you have many deceiving doctrines today. You have many deceptions today. And Paul says, concerning the return of the Lord, see that you are not deceived. For that day will not come unless there is a falling away first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, Paul says, I told you all these things, and now you know, listen to this carefully, and now you know... <clears throat> What is restraining or what is hindering or what is holding back the manifestation of the Antichrist? So Paul tells us clearly, now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness or the mystery of sin is already at work. And we all know that. We see the consequences. We see the fruits of the works of darkness. We see uh, what has happened because of sin in the world. And I know at this time, many people are trying all kinds of ceremonies and rituals. And some people are selling oil and they're selling holy water. And they're giving you all kind of prayer cloths and so on. Listen to me. The only solution to the sin problem is to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Don't follow all of these rituals and ceremonies and people selling you things run to the blood run to Jesus and say Lord Jesus wash me in your blood and he will cleanse you from your sin so the the mystery of sin is already at work only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way who is Paul talking about he's talking about the Holy Spirit who is operating through the church restraining the Antichrist from being manifested so the Antichrist cannot be manifested as long as the church is here. But when we are raptured, that ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church will no longer be here. Which is obvious. Now the Holy Spirit will continue to work in the world. The Holy Spirit will still be saving souls and drawing men. But he would not have that ministry of restraining the evil through the church because the church would have been raptured. So Paul simply says that the Antichrist cannot be manifested until the ministry of the Holy Spirit is taken away or the church is taken up. And then the lawless one, Paul says, will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy the, with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan 
with all power, signs and lying wonders and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And I want you to take note of this. It is not that God did not save them or God did not want to save them. The Bible says they did not receive the love of the truth. Just like in Romans chapter 1, the Bible says God gave them up because they rejected the creator and they began to worship the creature. And so these people, rather than loving the truth and rather than embracing the truth, what they do is reject the truth and follow a lie. You know, one man, a friend of mine, told me he's changed his life. I was talking to him recently. And I said, thank God, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you've changed your life. And he told me, he said, you know, I am meditating on life now. And that is good to change and think about life. But I want to tell everybody this. There is no life that you can meditate upon except Jesus Christ who is the life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. You cannot have another truth that is opposed to or contradicting Jesus Christ. There can only be one truth and that truth is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, uh, he is the son of the living God. And God has given us his word which uh, Deuteronomy tells us that the word of God is uh, the truth of God. God is the God of truth. So if you are looking for the truth, truth can only be found in Jesus Christ. And if you don't know him, come to him today before it is too late. If you die in your sins, you will not go to heaven. And if you die and go to hell, think about this. There is no repentance. There is nothing anybody can do. No prayers can save you. No nine nights, no 40 nights, no offerings. Nothing can help you. And there is no purgatory. There is no place that you can do, go to be purged to go into heaven. The truth is that it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Now, Paul refers to, in this chapter, uh, the Antichrist has, you know, three titles he uses. He says he's a man of sin. He is the son of perdition and he is the lawless one. And there are many other titles in the Bible, but in just these few verses, Paul uses these three designations. And we need to take note of Paul's emphasis on the deceptiveness of this man called the Antichrist and into to ensure that we are not deceived today. Now, there are some doctrines I'm hearing and I, I just want to warn you, um, do not be carried away with these doctrines and they are very deceptive doctrines. They are not of God. They are not consistent with the word of God. One, uh, the new doctrine is that Jesus did not come in the book of Matthew. Jesus actually came in Genesis chapter 3. That is not so. Jesus came in the flesh uh, through the Virgin Mary, as we read in the book of Matthew, Jesus did not come physically to the earth before that. He was incarnated, uh, as, as Galatians says, in the fullness of time. So that doctrine that is now bandied about is clearly unscriptural. Secondly, there is a new teaching for, from a very popular preacher in the United States. And he says that we need to remove the Old Testament from the Bible. We don't need the Old Testament. It is irrelevant. And we must concentrate only on the New Testament. This is devilish. It is deceptive. It is not of God. Because even Jesus quoted from the Old Testament. Paul quoted from the Old Testament. And if you read the New Testament, much of the Old Testament is found quoted in the New Testament, even in Hebrews and Galatians. So we cannot remove and rip off the Old Testament from our Bibles? No. The Old Testament tells us. And in fact, the Old Testament focuses on the coming of Christ. The New Testament tells us that Christ has come. And this is how we are to live. So don't get carried away with that. I know some people are confused. But it is unbiblical. T 
thirdly, uh, there are people who are now saying the Bible is not complete and that you need prophecy to complete the Bible. This is erroneous, it is deceptive, it is devilish, it is not of God because if you read Revelation, Paul, uh, sorry, John says that this Bible, this book is complete and you must not add or take away anything from it. And so anyone who adds or take away, John says the judgments of this book will fall on him. So anybody who tells you that you need prophecy, you need to come and get a prophetic word. And some of them are charging for a prophetic word. And we are hearing all kinds of prophecies now uh, because of what is happening. And I can tell you, be careful because not all of it is true. And I'm not saying God does not give a prophetic word. He does, but... Paul says, if you get a prophetic word, make sure it lines up with the word of the living God. If it does not, reject it because God cannot and God will not give any new revelation that is separate and apart from the Bible. Then uh, there's another teaching by a very, very popular preacher in the United States, very popular pastor. And he says, you know, Jesus uh, is not the only way. And, you know, he says, he, he was in an interview with uh, a well-known um, television, television personality. And, you know, this pastor was asked, what about those who don't know Jesus Christ? Will they go to hell? And the best answer he could give, he says, you know, I don't know. And I'm not so sure these people are so genuine. I mean, he was saying, you know, I think God is still going to take them because they are so sincere. Hear me. You are not saved by your sincerity. You are not saved by your good works. You are not saved by your own righteousness. You are saved only by the grace of God through faith. It is not of works lest any man should boast. You can be how sincere you are. You cannot be saved until you submit to Jesus Christ and repent of your sins. Isn't it strange that in the world today, in the churches today, you have all of these doctrines that millions of people are following. When Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times, many will depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducive doctrines and doctrines of devils. Saints of God, be careful. Don't follow these false doctrines. In fact, the Bible says the early church continued uh, tenaciously. They held on to the apostolic doctrines. They did not sway from the doctrines of the apostle. And, you know, I, I was listening to another renowned pastor in the United States of America. And I was really, really amazed by what he said. When he quoted this same passage in Acts, he said that, you know, God did not give a list of the apostles' doctrines. That means that there are still apostolic doctrines today. And there are new apostolic doctrines. And the church must follow these new apostolic doctrines. That is of the devil. It is not of God. It is a lie. God is not given some new apostolic doctrine. God has given us his word and many people are speculating into the things of the spiritual and coming up with all kind of deceptive teachings. But the Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord. What is revealed belong to us. Listen to me. Hold on to this. Learn this. Study this. Meditate upon this. Live by this and you shall be successful and prosperous as Joshua 1, 8 tells us. So these are deceptive doctrines. And, you know, when we read this passage that Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians, one of the main things that stand out about this man, the Antichrist, is that he seeks to be like God. And the Bible says he is even worshipped by the world as if he is God. Daniel chapter 11, 36 to 37 says that the king, that is the Antichrist, who will be a king in the tribulation period, he shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt himself and he shall magnify himself above every God. God. You see, at the beginning of the tribulation, the Antichrist will allow religions and so on to continue. And in fact, there's going to be an amalgamation, a unification of religions, much like what uh, we are hearing from um, the Vatican right now. Um, on May 14, the Vatican said that they're going to have, you know, 
um, uh, all the religions come together and they're going to create a new secular humanism. And it is very strange that uh, one who proclaims to be Christian and one who proclaims to know Christ um, is doing this and bringing Muslims together and Hindus together and everybody and say, hey, we can have one religion. And it's exactly what the Bible says. Exactly. Revelation chapter 17 talks about this. Uh, called the uh, mystery woman, the harlot, uh, referring to that one world religion that the Antichrist will use for a time. But here's the thing, at the middle of a tribulation, he begins to exalt himself and he puts off all other religions and say, everybody now must worship me. And when he says me, he means Satan because uh, he will be Satan's masterpiece. Now, the Bible says that he will... Regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. For he shall exalt himself above them all. Doesn't that song just like what Satan did in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28 when the Bible talks about a fall of Lucifer in heaven. Now, look at Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. The Bible says that the world will worship him. All who dwell on the earth, the Bible says, will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, let me touch on my second point. Um, and I've, I hope I've made that point clear. Who is the Antichrist? We don't know exactly who is the Antichrist, but we know he will be a man, a real man, uh, who will arise in the tribulation period. So don't try to figure out who it is, but know that it will be a man. Secondly, what is the role of the Antichrist? Several passages in the Old Testament and in the New Testament tell us much about this man and what his role will be in the last days. First, uh, Daniel explains how he will emerge as the head of the revived Roman Empire. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream that God gave him that he could not remember. He called all the magicians from his empire and they could not tell him what the dream was but thank God Daniel said oh King Nebuchadnezzar I will tell you what the dream was and thank God for a man of God thank God for a man who really knew God because Daniel Meshach Shadrach and Abednego would have been killed also but the Bible says they that know their God shall be strong and they shall do great exploits so you need to know who your God is in this trying time you need to stand up like Daniel Daniel was able to tell King Nebuchadnezzar don't kill out the magicians don't kill them out I am going before my God and I will tell you the dream that you had and I will tell you what the interpretation of it is can you imagine that Daniel went to God and God told him what Nebuchadnezzar had dreamt you don't read about this in any other so called holy book thank God the God we serve knows every dream he knows everything, what is visible and what is invisible, what is seen and what is unseen. God knows everything. So God revealed to Daniel as Daniel went before God and prayed. And God showed Daniel the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had. And then ne Daniel went to Nebuchadnezzar and told him the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar agreed with everything. And Nebuchadnezzar realized that Daniel was not like the ordinary man. But that the spirit of God was in him. And this is a testimony every Christian should have. Everywhere you go, people should see that you have the spirit of God in you. And that you are different. And just as Daniel knew his God in a time when their lives were threatened. So the church today must know who God is. In this threatening circumstance. In this situation that the world is in. We must stand up. As A.W. Tosa said, a frightened world needs a fearless church that's the kind of church we ought to be God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind Christians stand up don't quake don't cower under these rough circumstances but stand up like Daniel and let us demonstrate to the world that our God lives that our God is not dead that our God is in control and our God is going to deal with all the problems of this world so Daniel tells Nebuchadnezzar now he says 
Your dream was a, a huge image, an image of a man. It was gigantic. And he said, this image had a head of gold. And the chest and arms were made of silver. And the belly and the thighs were made of bronze. And then the legs were of iron. And then the feet were made of iron and clay. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar, I can imagine how stunned he was that this young man, Daniel, can tell him what he dreamt. I thank God there is nothing impossible with our God. And when you go before God, and I, I thank God for the power of prayer. I thank God for the medium of prayer. I thank God we can dwell in the secret place of the Most High God. I thank God we can get to know Him intimately. And through prayer, we can receive the power of God to deal with the problem of our world so Daniel says to him now I will give you the interpretation and he said oh King Nebuchadnezzar the head of gold is your empire the Babylonian empire and I want you just to take note prophetically that what God was doing here was showing Daniel and giving us in his word uh, the Gentile Nations and empires that will rule from around 586 BC when Babylon rode into Jerusalem and destroyed the temple of Jerusalem, the Solomonic temple, when they destroyed it. And God was showing uh, Nebuchadnezzar here and gave Daniel the interpretation of uh, what nations and or what empires will rule from that time right until the Battle of Armageddon. So here is the thing. He says, the head of gold is you, Nebuchadnezzar. It is your empire, the Babylonian empire. But after you will come another empire. And that was the Medo-Persian empire that came after Babylon. They came and fought out the Babylonians and won the battle. And so Medo-Persia began to rule the world. And then Daniel says, the belly now and the thighs, they are made of bronze. That refers now to the Grecian Empire that was led by Alexander the Great, um, who we read about in many of our literature, books, and so on. But Alexander the Great uh, came on the scene like a leopard. He came, you know, swiftly, and he overtook the world and ruled for a little while. And then after him, his kingdom was divided into four uh, generals. And um, after him now, the Bible tells us that there will be the legs of iron. That refers to the Roman Empire. That's the empire that ruled when Jesus Christ was upon the earth. And if you look at it, everything Daniel said uh, from the late 6th century, um, Daniel in, in the 500s, all that Daniel saw, if you go back to the historical books, you will see it was fulfilled exactly. And there's much more to be fulfilled. But in terms of these empires, you would go back to history and you would see that Babylon did rule. You can go to Encyclopedia Britannica or any world history books and you would see this. That there was a Babylonian empire and after them were the Medo-Persians and then the Grecian empire and then the Roman empire that was led by the Caesars. Now... Everything that the Bible said that would happen in, in Daniel chapter 2 came to pass. And there's yet more to come to pass. But I want to take note of this. Daniel says, the feet now of this man was made of clay and iron. And the feet now, the ten toes there, refers to the ten horns and refers to ten nations. So what Daniel is saying is that there is going to be uh, a revived form of the Roman Empire in the last days. And this is what we call the revived Roman Empire that will come to rule. Now the, re the Roman Empire is not ruling right now. Their rule uh, uh, came to an end. Uh, about a thousand years ago. They ruled upon the earth for about close to 1500 years. So they, their rule came to an end. But here is the thing. Daniel says that kingdom. Daniel chapter 9, 24 to 27. Daniel says that that kingdom will arise again on the earth. But when it arises again on the earth. It will be the confederation of ten nations. And these ten nations will come together. And they will form this economic block. That will literally command the attention of the world. Now at present the European Union is comprised of 27 nations. So it is clear that the European Union is not the revived Roman Empire. Because the Roman Empire will be comprised of only ten nations. But 
the European Union is paving the way for that, anti, that empire to come on the, the scene. Now, take note of this. That empire cannot include nations like America and Canada and Australia and New Zealand. No, that empire must come out of the same area, the same geographic area that the Roman Empire at the time of Christ um, possessed, which would be from Italy going through Spain to the Rhine River in Germany and coming all around through Morocco, Algeria, and encompassing all of that. So the ten nations, according to Daniel chapter 8 and chapter 11, the ten nations must come from that geographic area. This is why we says, you know, the, the, the revived Roman Empire must come from um, either Europe or the Middle East or a combination of countries in Europe and the Middle East. And when these ten nations join together... Uh, Daniel chapter 7 verse 7 says it will be the coming together of the ten horns. Now Daniel chapter 8 verse 8 says, um, Daniel says, I was considering the horns and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them. That little horn is the Antichrist. So this tells us that the Antichrist will not be a popular figure. He will be a little horn. He will be insignificant. People will not know about him. But here is the thing. That little horn is going to arise among the ten horns and overtake the ten horns. In fact, the Bible says that when that little horn comes on the scene, he will overthrow three of the other horns. So he will take over three nations in the ten nation confederation and then the other seven nations will submit their authority to this man whom the Bible calls the little horn and uh, Daniel says and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man talks about his intelligence he's going to speak so eloquently that people will be so amazed and I'm out speaking pompous words and this man will Govern that ten nation empire. Now, second, as head of the revived Roman Empire, the Antichrist will go now and sign a peace treaty with Israel for a peace period of seven years. And that seven years is the same as the tribulation period. And this is the same period that follows the rapture of the church. It cannot happen before. It would happen um, after the church has been raptured. But it will be a false peace that Israel and the world will think is the solution to the world's problem. And they will think that this is the end of all wars. Israel will embrace this man and think that he is the promised Messiah. And this is what Jesus referred to in John chapter 4 verse 43 when he said, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. Jesus was talking about the Antichrist. The nation of Israel has rejected Jesus, their true Messiah, for 2,000 years. And they're still looking for a Messiah to come and rescue them from their troubles. Unfortunately, they will initially accept the Antichrist as the Messiah and be misled for those three and a half years. We will conclude here for today. But we will continue this message next Sunday. And we want you to tune in and... Um, Take note as we deal with these things because we are living in very troublesome times and we are living in days when God is preparing the earth for the tribulation period when he is going to pour out judgments upon the world and then Jesus Christ will come and rule the world. But saints of God, you need to know about these things because one-fifth of this Bible is prophecy and Jesus says we must not be ignorant of these times. So we thank you for listening and we ask you to join us again next Sunday when we will continue this message. And uh, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we beg you, we beg you before it is too late, please surrender to him. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and make me a child of God. Simple as that. Then find a Bible-believing church and join with that church and fellowship. In the meanwhile, you can connect with us through the same means. And you can call us at 483-4485 or 345-4501. Those numbers again, 483-4485 or 345-4501. And we'll be glad to help you in your walk with Christ. So saints of God, hold on. And if you don't know Jesus, Jesus, please surrender to him today. We want to remind you to listen on Wednesday for our next program from 7 to 8. Here is Reverend Reynolds. Amen. Hallelujah.
Lord, we thank you for that word. We thank you for the exposition of the word that came clearly with power and authority. We want to thank all of you who joined us today on Facebook Live um, for streaming in. We appreciate it. We know that you had many, many choices, but we thank you that you chose to be here with us. We see this as a joy. This is a service um, that we are given to you because we see this as something that God gave us. Our commandment is to spread the gospel to every creature. And so we take joy in doing this. We thank God that we have the ability to still pray and to still worship. There are many, many countries where they can't open their doors, but they can't even stream the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we are a country that can. And so we ought to take every opportunity possible to spread this gospel, to spread this message of, of hope, of joy, of peace, of the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we thank you. And again, as Pastor Sina said, on Wednesday, we're going to have a next, a next live stream from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then next week, Sunday, we continue again from 8.30 in the morning to 10 a.m. We appreciate all of you. We thank you. And we pray God's blessings. This week, please be safe. Take care of yourself. Understand and listen to what, what your governments are saying. Be very attentive um, to your surroundings. Um, practice all the hygienic um, uh, principles that are required. But also maintain your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is more than able to keep you in every situation. And remember, his name is above every other name, including the coronavirus. Amen? Let's close off in prayer. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we bless you, we magnify you, we thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you, Lord, that we Though we are in the world, we are not of this world. We are just passing through, waiting for the Messiah to come. Thank you, Lord, that we have this eternal hope in Christ Jesus. While we were sinners, Christ died for us so that he could redeem us from the curse of sin and we could be restored back to relationship with God. Lord, we thank you. We just say thank you. We declare, God, your healing virtue, your healing power over us and over your people watching through this live stream and over the entire world. Let the name of Christ be exalted during this time. We give you praise and we magnify you. We thank you, God, for this and we bless your holy name. Bless your people in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Join us again on Wednesday from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then next week, Sunday, 8.30 to 10 a.m. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Take care.